Hey friends, Josh here. I wanted to make a short video for you on a passage from the Gospels that gets a lot of attention and it's commonly misunderstood by a lot of modern evangelical Christians, and that's Matthew 5.17. It's where Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So I grew up in evangelical Christian and charismatic circles, where the words fulfilled and fulfillment were usually used to talk about prophetic words, whether they be something from the Bible or something else spoken by another person. We'd say, Jesus fulfilled Isaiah 53, or those prophecies given to me a few years ago were fulfilled. And what we usually meant was something like, the thing that was predicted came to pass, and the box got checked, or God did what he said. Now... In English and modern parlance, this is definitely a way we can understand the word fulfillment. And sure, this works for many of the things we see in the prophets. For instance, the Gospels tell us that the Messiah came lowly and riding on a donkey, a fulfillment of the words in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And the apostles wrote that Jesus was pierced for our transgressions, a fulfillment of Isaiah 53. But what does it mean that Jesus fulfilled the law? Well, some Christians, both at a popular level and in the scholarly world, have been pretty vocal in saying that Jesus fulfilling the law meant that the covenant at Mount Sinai, sometimes called the Old Covenant, was ended once and for all, and that God checked the box, and the purpose for that covenant is fulfilled and no longer is relevant or is needed anymore. One pastor went so far as saying that to fulfill the law means to bring it to an end completely, but is that what Jesus means? And is that what Jews in the first century would have heard when Jesus said these words as recorded in Matthew 5? Well, I don't think so. And here's why. Just read the next few verses in Matthew 5. This is Matthew 5, 18 and 19. Jesus says, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So if the Jesus of verse 17 is saying, the law is ended and you don't have to do any more of those commandments, Israel, then the Jesus of verse 18 and 19 seemingly didn't get his memo because he goes on to affirm the importance of keeping the law and he gives severe consequences for anyone who relaxes any of the Torah's instructions. He, in fact, did mean that he's not abolishing or doing away with the Torah for Israel whatsoever. So what does Jesus mean when he said that he came to fulfill the Torah? Well, it turns out this is a common phrase in other Jewish literature from around Jesus' time. This is why history is so valuable. In the writings of the Jewish rabbis, they use the Hebrew word lekayem, which means to uphold, to establish, to fulfill, to complete, or to accomplish. So when they said that they fulfilled the Torah, or in doing something that they would fulfill the commandment, they're using an idiom to speak about correctly interpreting the Torah so that it can be properly kept. Similarly, the word abolish was either levatel or la akor, which would mean to undermine the Torah by misinterpreting it. So let's look at a few examples here from Jewish literature. This first one is from the Mishnah, which is a collection of sayings from the rabbis on the Torah, dating from about 200 BC to about 200 AD. This particular saying is one of the earlier ones from before 70 AD. This is Mishnah Hariyot 1.3. If the Sanhedrin gives a decision to abolish or uproot la akur, a law, by saying, for instance, that the Torah does not include the laws of Sabbath or idolatry, the members of the court are free from a sin offering if they obey them. But if the Sanhedrin abolishes la akur, only one part of a law, but fulfills la kayem, another part, they are liable. Here's another one from Nemesha, Pirkei Avot 4.14. Go away to a place of study of the Torah, and do not suppose that it will come to you. For your fellow disciples will fulfill it, the KM in your hand, and on your own understanding, do not rely. So in both of these examples, you can see these two Hebrew words, levatel and laakor, and you can see that in both of them, fulfill means to explain and to interpret the Torah. So if you give a bad interpretation on the Torah, you failed to fulfill the intention. Okay, so more simply said, if you've got a commandment and you misunderstand it and you do something totally different than what was commanded, well, you haven't fulfilled 
that commandment. So this is the language of the rabbis. Let's look at a couple more examples. This next one is from the Mishnah as well, Sukkot 2.7. And in this particular example, one rabbi is criticizing another rabbi's interpretation of the Torah, which he says caused him to not do what it really intends. It says, if this is how you act, you have never in your whole life fulfilled the requirement of dwelling in a sukkah. Now, if you're not familiar, a sukkah is just a booth or a tent, and that was part of the commandment surrounding Israel's celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles every year. Another one, one more. This is from Perkei Avot as well. Whoever fulfills the Torah when poor will, in the end, fulfill it in wealth. And whoever treats the Torah as nothing when he is wealthy, in the end, will treat it as nothing in poverty. So here, the word fulfilled means to obey. Whoever obeys the Torah when poor will obey it in wealth. Do you see how this example in particular is completely opposite of modern Christian interpretations of the word fulfilled, which means just the boxes got checked and the old covenant or the law is just done away with altogether now? It doesn't make sense. So if we're to rightly understand Jesus in his first century context as a rabbi, as a teacher, Jesus is just using common rabbinic language and he's doing the same thing as the rabbis of his day did. He's teaching the Torah to Israel and explaining to them how to properly keep it as God intended. Of course, this is what he's doing throughout the Sermon on the Mount, for example, when he says, you've heard it said, you shall not murder, but I tell you, if you hate your brother in your heart, you're murdering him. He's explaining the Torah and he's indicating how to properly keep it. So often, these words about the fulfillment of the law from Matthew 5 are used in a context of replacement theology, to say that the commandments that God gave Israel and the terms of the covenant at Mount Sinai are no longer binding on Israel, and that Jesus was doing away with the old law and the system of Judaism and bringing in a new system of grace through Christianity. I hope it's clear to you now that in this particular passage, Jesus was actually saying the exact opposite. Jesus affirms the need for Israel to walk in God's instructions, that they would be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, and that the rest of the nations may be blessed as God intended through his covenantal promises to Abraham. Well, there's much more that could be said about this, especially for Gentiles like me, but if this was encouraging or clarifying, you'd like me to make another video on this, leave me your questions or comments down below. Until next time, God bless, Shalom, and Maranatha.